Now, you know how I love to use old movie clips in my videos, and so I looked for some old movies about the Peloponnesian War. And uh, much to my consternation, there were hardly any to speak of. There was one that was Assassin's Creed Odyssey. It's a video game. That's, that's number one, the video game. And 300 Spartans, that's not, that's the Persian War, not Peloponnesian War. Okay, Lysistrata by Aristophanes, uh, that is about the Peloponnesian War, which is, which is, actually serves as a kind of propaganda designed to make Athens lose the Peloponnesian War. But, but you see, that's, that's it. And there was another one that was almost like a bootleg video of some famous actors reciting speeches in Thucydides' book, but nothing actually showing it. Athenians, I want you to see that behind this threat of war, there is more at stake for us than there is for other cities. Oh, except this Greek one. That's about it. But nothing, nothing that big. I mean, can you imagine that? All the sword and sandal movies they made, Gladiator, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, 300. But never one about one of the most famous, painstakingly documented wars in history. What is it that the Jews in Hollywood are reticent to put on the big screen? Well, I thought about it, and I think they have put it on the big screen, but in different ways. To show you what I mean, I'm going to be intercutting between Thucydides' account, Symptoms of Deadly Nightshade Poisoning, Outbreak, a 1996 movie about a hemorrhagic fever such as Ebola, Batman Begins, and various zombie movies, because I think zombie movies are actually based on the Plague of Athens, or Typhus, or Ebola, or any of the array of diseases that can be lumped into the category of hemorrhagic fever. And if you haven't seen these movies, you may actually have a hard time distinguishing between them because they're all depicting the same thing. Predictive programming, anybody? Hiding history in plain sight? So I guess the question I have for you is, are you ready to be horrified? Unpleasant, to be sure, but you can bet there are plans in the works to do this again. So we ought to be ready for the once in future zombie apocalypse. The good news is that it's not contagious, so don't go shooting zombies. There is an antidote to this poison. I'm sorry, Aspasia, about Pericles and Athens. You have no need to apologize for anything. It feels like I let everyone down. I didn't get to them quick enough. Didn't make the right decisions. It's not your fault. There's no one to blame but a cult of Cosmos. Yeah, so even here they're saying some cult perpetrated the Plague of Athens. The cult of Cosmos. I don't suppose this cult has anything to do with those pantheist wizards that say the entire Cosmos is God, including themselves, does it? You know, the Kabbalists. But if we affirm our faith, and we live a life based on God is one, and we are one with God, and one with each other through God. We will always hide the divine truth from them, but we are all one. And you are in touch with reality, because God is reality. Here, what, what say we eavesdrop on a meeting of the cult of cosmos, shall we? I think it would go a little bit like this. We are here today, not just to talk about the future of this company, we're here to talk about its destiny. We're here to talk about the end of the world. We stand on the brink of Armageddon. Global warming will melt the polar ice gaps within 80 years, flooding 90% of all habitable areas on Earth. Unchecked population growth will overtake food production in less than 50 years, leading to famine and war. This is not conjecture. This is fact, one way or another. Our world is coming to an end. Now the question is, will we end with it? What do you propose? I propose that we end the world, but on our terms. An orchestrated apocalypse. One that will cleanse the earth of its population, but leave its infrastructure and resources intact. It's been done once before with great success. Hey guys, what is up? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and today we'll be taking a quick look at the Crippen virus, as featured in the movie I Am Legend, starring Will Smith. 
The movie is a loose adaptation of the novel with the same name by Richard Matheson, published in 1954. The title character, Robert Neville, is the sole survivor of a pandemic which causes those infected to suffer from symptoms resembling vampirism. This group were known as the Dark Seekers, who fed on the remaining 1% of the population. When a host is infected with KV, they slowly succumb to the disease over the course of 48 hours. During that time, the host will suffer symptoms such as fever and hemorrhaging. Have you ever seen the effects of hemorrhagic fever? No, sir. The host will suffer symptoms such as fever and hemorrhaging. Have you ever seen the effects of hemorrhagic fever? No, sir. Allow me, sir. Major? Yes, Major. When the patient first gets the virus, he complains of flu-like symptoms, and in two or three days, pink lesions begin to appear all over his body, along with small pustules that soon erupt with the blood and pus, a kind of milky These substance. These particular lesions begins. become full-blown. They feel like mush to the touch. There's vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding in the nose, ears, gums. The eyes hemorrhage. The internal organs shut down. They liquefy. That's very good, Major. Uh, we've read that in the book, too, but in about 16 hours, you are about to see it. Okay, let's begin. This is the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides, and this is his account of the Plague of Athens. I give to you the T-Virus. He released it deliberately. Year two. In the very beginning of summer, the Peloponnesians and allies, with two-thirds of their forces, made an incursion as before into Attica, under the command of Archidamus, son of Zeuxidamus, king of the Lacedaemonians, including Sparta, etc., and having formed their camp, ravaged the country. They had not been many days in Attica before a sickness began first to appear amongst the Athenians. Now notice, they were there in Attica, so they first arrived in Attica. Soon after their arrival, the plague started. I mean, don't you find that to be a coincidence that a few days after the enemy army arrives, suddenly a disease wipes out Athens. Okay, so the sickness began to first appear amongst the Athenians, such as was reported to have raged before this in other parts, as about Lemnos and other places. Yet a plague so great as this, and so dreadful a calamity in human memory could not be paralleled. The physicians at first could administer no relief through utter ignorance, Nay, they died the fastest, the closer their attendance on the sick, and all human art was totally unavailing. Whatever supplications were offered in the temples, whatever recourse to oracles and religious rites, all were insignificant. At last, expedients of this nature they totally relinquished, overpowered by calamity. What's the weirdest thing you've ever saw in here? Oh, kid. I have seen weird things come, and I have seen weird things go. But the weirdest thing I ever saw just had to cap it all. Oh, yeah? <laughs> What's that? Let me ask you a question, kid. Did you see that movie, Night of the Living Dead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one where the corpses start eating the people, right? Sure. What, what about it? Did you know that movie was based on a true case? Oh, come on, you're shitting me, right? I ain't never been more serious in my life. This movie says that Night of the Living Dead was based on a true story. And at the beginning, it has this disclaimer. Hmm. That's not possible. I mean, they showed zombies taking over the world. Well, they changed it all around. What really happened was, back in 1969, in Pittsburgh at the VA hospital, there was a chemical spill. And all that stuff kind of leaked down into the morgue and it made all the dead bodies kind of jump around as though it was alive. What chemical? 245 trioxin, it's called. It was to kind of spray on marijuana or something. Yeah, see, they're already lying to you with this uh, 245 trioxin stuff. Uh, notice the number 999 here. Okay, so. 245 trioxin is loosely based on Agent Orange, but the problem is that Agent Orange does not have the symptoms of zombieism. So they're, they're mixing their chemicals here. And you'll notice that the effects of Agent Orange are not at all the same as what is in the movie Return of the Living Dead. Why is that? Because they're, they're switching the poisons up on you. They're hiding the poison that causes zombieism in plain sight. And the Darrow Chemical Company was trying to develop it for the army. And they told the guy 
who made the movie that if he told the true story, they'd just soup his ass off. So he changed all the facts around. So what really happened? Well, they closed it all down, see? And the army shipped all that contaminated dirt and all those dead bodies out. And they kept it a secret. So how come you know about it? Typical army fuck up. The transportation department got the orders crossed. And they shipped those bodies here. Instead of to the Darrow Chemical Company. It broke out first, as it is said, in that part of Ethiopia which borders upon Egypt. It afterwards spread into Egypt and Libya and into great part of the king's dominions. And from thence it on a sudden fell on the city of Athenians. Now notice it says, as it is said. As it is said by who? We trust these, these Greeks to be reliable narrators. Are we sure? Because take a look here. The letters of Hippocrates which mention this affair are certainly spurious. The facts they would establish are without any grounds, as Leclerc hath proved to conviction in his Histoire de la Medicine. They make the plague to have broke out first in Europe and to have spread from thence into the dominions of the king of Persia. So there's another account that says it started in Europe and moved to Persia. But Thucydides says it started in Africa and moved its way up into Europe. So we have conflicting accounts. And I don't know why I would believe Thucydides over this other guy, Hippocrates. I think they could both be wrong. Okay. The contagion showed itself first in the Piraeus, which is the uh, port city that was surrounded by the wall along with Athens. One significant development during this period was the rebuilding of Athens' walls on a grand scale, with a long causeway connecting Athens with the port city of Piraeus, allowing Athens to be fully supplied by sea, even if an invading army would destroy the surrounding countryside and farmland which occasioned a report that the Peloponnesians had caused poison to be thrown into the wells, for as yet there were no fountains there. This, I think, is what really happened. They caused poison to be thrown into the wells. The Spartans poisoned the Athenians, in my opinion. First case, patient zero. A young man called Murazo worked with a white man to build a, a road into Kinshasa, and when he returned, he was sick, I see. and he drank from this well. From there, it spreads to the entire village. Another guy saying it's some kind of chemical spill making everybody go crazy. They don't know shit. Hey, these things don't leak, do they? Leak? Hell no. These things were made by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This is one of the deadliest plants in the world. Eat just a handful of its berries and you'd be in real trouble. A favorite tool of kings, queens, and witches. This toxic plant lives up to its name. This is Deadly Nightshade. This toxin is derived from the organic compound found in our blue flowers. He was able to weaponize it. He's not a member of the League of Shadows. Of course not. He thought our plan was to hold the city to ransom. But really, you are gonna release Crane's poison on the entire city. Then watch Gotham tear itself apart through fear. We will make them kill each other when it suits us. After this, it spread into the upper city, and then the mortality very much increased. Notice how the contagion first shows itself in Piraeus, which is the port city. And from there, it goes into Athens. The theory here is that the plague was transmitted from food that was imported into Athens from her empire. What had not been taken into account was tainted grain shipments carrying plague, which rapidly spread through the overcrowded city. 
but I'm not buying that because this plague is way too contagious and it kills people too fast. Even birds can track this disease, but somehow the Spartans are unscathed. The merchants that hauled it would all be dying too, but you don't hear about that, do you? After this, it spread into the upper city, and then the mortality very much increased. Let everyone, physician or not, freely declare his own sentiments about it. What the hell are you doing? Gentlemen, time to spread the word. And the word is... assign any credible account of its rise, or the causes strong enough in his opinion to introduce so terrible a scene. I shall only relate what it actually was, and, as from an information in all its symptoms, none may be quite at a loss about it, if it ever should happen again. I believe it's happened many times again, it's just called different names. I shall give an exact detail of them, having been sick of it myself and seen many others afflicted with it. Belladonna. What is Belladonna? Belladonna is a plant known as Atropa Belladonna, such and such, such and such, deadly nightshade, devil's cherries, devil's herb, etc., etc., poison black cherries. And here's some interesting information on Belladonna. Belladonna has been used in alternative medicine as an aid in treating arthritis pain, colds, hay fever, etc., etc. While it is not certain whether Belladonna is effective in treating any medical condition, <laughs> it's not certain it works in anything, but it is used here. It is used in alternative medicine. We will promise to find a cure from our many fronts, yet we will feed them more poison. And Belladonna can be toxic. Yes, a poison can be toxic, truth be told. Yeah, this is some serious uh, natural selection going on here. People being recommended poison to take as an herbal remedy. Did you see the part where it says, wait, look up here. It is not certain whether Belladonna is effective in treating any medical condition. How should I take Belladonna? You shouldn't. Call your doctor if the condition you are treating with Belladonna does not improve, or if it gets worse while using this product. Yeah, maybe it's the, or maybe call a different doctor, because the one you have just gave you poison. This very year, as is universally allowed, has been more than any other remarkably free from common disorders. Or whatever diseases had seized the body, they ended at length in this. That reminds me of COVID-19. You know, every year there's, there's so many deaths from the flu, but once COVID-19 hit, suddenly the deaths from flu just dropped to zero, and everything's being counted as COVID-19. So this very much reminds me of what's happening now with COVID-19. But those who enjoyed the most perfect health were suddenly, without any apparent cause, seized at first with headaches, extremely violent. What are the possible side effects of belladonna? Okay, let's look for a headache, right? Let's see, headache, headache. Hmm, it's not here. Oh, well, I guess I guess that's it then, huh? This is not it. False alarm. But wait, wait a second. This is not a complete list of side effects, and others may occur. Call your doctor for medical advice about side effects. Oh, so the doctor knows certain side effects that they're not telling us. That's interesting. Where can I get more information? Your pharmacist has more information about Belladonna written for health professionals that you may read. You may not read it here. We're hiding something from you here. If you go talk to them, they may know. So what is it that they know that they're not telling us here? Well, I found another book on it called 
The Guiding Symptoms of Our Materia Medica by Constantine Herring. This is from uh, the 1800s. They printed this. And they have quite a bit. I mean, look at all these symptoms of Belladonna. So let's see if we find them in here. I don't know about you, but I'm really sick. What? What's wrong, Fred? I feel like hell is what's wrong. I'm really sick. I'm sick too, Bert. Sick? Like how? I feel like my head's gonna bust wide open. Okay, headaches, right? Let's look for headaches. In the the uh, Belladonna page. And she has deadly nightshade. Inner head. Frontal headache. Oppressive headache, especially in forehead. Headache as if a stone was pressed on the forehead. Painful pressure in head. Sensation as if brain was pressed to forehead. First, I got a really fucked headache. Seized at first with headaches, extremely violent, with inflammations and fiery redness in the eyes. Red eyes, eh? Sight in eyes. Eyes are congested, look very red, cannot bear light. A severe intolerance to UV light begins to develop, similar to vampirism. Inflammation of eyes, with redness and swelling of lids. Are you gonna eat the rest of that cookie? No. You can have it, Sheriff. No, 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 no. Bobby, don't bother the nice man. It's no problem. Now, I don't want no trouble with the law. <sighs> In chronic forms of hyperemia, if a red conjunctival line is very marked along line of fissure of lids. Itching and burning of lids. Bleeding from lids. You really shoot your own partner? What's going on with your eye? Lids swollen red like irispellus. Let me look up irispellus. Oh, that's irispellus, okay. Lids puffy, red, and congested. Lids feel sore, red, congested, and swollen. Within, the throat and tongue began instantly to be red as blood. Okay, tongue and mouth. Let's see. Taste, speech, tongue, inner mouth. Let's take a look at this. Tongue, inflamed and much swollen. Papillae of deep red color. Tip and edges light red. What is papillae? Okay, the papillae are like the bud, like the taste buds or the buds, the, the things on the tongue. Okay. The tongue is painful, especially to the touch. It is red, hot, and dry, with red edges and white in the middle. Red streak in the middle of tongue. Well, this is white in the middle. This is red streak in the middle of the tongue. Tongue, white center with red edges or two white stripes, covered with white, clammy fur, which can be pulled off in string. Ugh. Dry and furred, covered with much tenacious yellowish white mucus. Stick your tongue out for me. Inner mouth. Red inflammatory swelling of inner mouth and soft palate. The fosses, uvule and tonsils are scarlet and shiny. Sore throat, fosses and pharynx, deep red. Jimbo, can you hear me? Jimbo, we're here to help you, but we need to know how you got sick. Can you talk to me? Jimbo? Hello? The breath was drawn with difficulty. Let's go to respiration. Short breath. Shortness of breath after drinking coffee in the afternoon. Respiration rapid and somewhat oppressed. Short, hurried, anxious breathing. Quick, short, irregular breathing. Alternates with slow, gentle, at times almost imperceptible breathing in a child. Respiration difficult. 
The breath was drawn with difficulty and had a noisome smell. Bad breath. Let's take a look at this. Inner mouth again. Foul odor from mouth. Peculiar odor from mouth, but with slightly coated tongue. The symptoms that succeeded these were sneezing and hoarseness. When the patient first gets the virus, it complains of flu-like symptoms. Does belladonna cause sneezing? Let's smell in nose. Frequent sneezing. Frequent dry sneezing with tickling, especially in left nostril. Spasmonic sneezing with cough of children. And hoarseness. Hoarseness. What's the voice hoarse? Voice and larynx. Trachea. Hoarse outcries. Hoarseness, which is especially violent when crying. Hoarse rough voice with dryness in throat. Voice hoarse and weak. And not long after, the malady descended to the breast with a violent cough. Cough. Does belladonna cause cough? Dry cough from dryness of larynx. Dry cough day and night. Cough accompanied by red injected throat. Is he okay? Him? Oh yeah, no, he's fucking fine, yeah. I mean, who doesn't cough up a little blood on the floor when they're feeling sick? And it goes on from there. It's all cough, 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 cough. Cough causing congestion of face and great redness of eyes. Let me get something to drink. Now you'll notice that it starts in the head and it works its way down all the way to the bowels and then you and you go well why is it following this this path well it sounds like they ate something doesn't it sound like they ate something or they drank something and went down their digestive tract but when once settled in the stomach it excited vomitings in which was thrown up all that matter physicians call discharges of bile attended with excessive torture vomiting let's see nausea Vomiting of mucus, of bile, and mucus or undigested food. Vomits bloody phlegm and improves. Vomit watery, slimy, bilious fluid. And I want to puke. A great part of the infected were subject to such violent hiccups without any discharge. Hiccups. A hiccup is a hiccup. Attacks of violent hiccoughs. Crying on account of pain from the hiccoughs. Then in my, my stomach started cramping, cramping up. As brought upon them a strong convulsion to some but of a short, to others of a very long continuance. So here they're talking about vomiting and dry heaves. There's vomiting. <laughs> Why does one vomit so excessively? Why does the body do that? Because you ate or drank something, logically. Just saying. Now, they'll have us believe here that a bacteria is making them vomit. But I have a hard time imagining a bacteria doing that, and doing that this quickly. Thucydides says this stage of the illness lasts seven to nine days. Bacteria takes a while to grow and multiply, does it not? Poison, that acts real quick. Just saying. The body to the outward touch was neither exceedingly hot nor of a pallid hue, but reddish, livid. So let's take a look at the skin here. Uh, now livid actually means bluish, like the way a bruise is bluish. So keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> heat over whole body with bluish redness. There's your livid, there's your reddish. Bluish redness of whole surface. Heat, redness, and dryness of skin. Red, hot swelling of affected parts. Skin alternately red and pale. So sometimes red, sometimes pale. So the movies, you'll see that the there's these red sores all over the body, but the skin itself is pale. But here it says red and pale. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Oh, no! oh, no! oh, no! oh, no! oh, no! 
Uh, Let's get a shirt, huh? Uh, what are you doing, honey? Oh, you'll oh, see. Oh, God. Uh, the bruise is where he's lying down. Uh, that's blood pooling up. Uh, Marked all over with little pustules and sores. Pustules and sores. Let's look up the word pustule. <clears throat> Pustules break out on cheek and nose, which rapidly fill with pus. And in two or three days, pink lesions begin to appear all over his body, along with small pustules that soon erupt with the blood and pus, a kind of milky substance. These particular lesions become full-blown. They feel like mush to the touch. Large blood boil on thigh, discharging yellow, thick, bloody pus. Uh, on the lower face, you have pustules or abscess on upper lip, pustule at border of lips on the skin, pustules on nape of neck, arms, and back. Men wounded in battle we can deal with, but this strange disease. Thirty men dead yesterday, eighteen the day before. We need supplies. Plasma, penicillin. We'll get you everything you need, doctor. Vesicular eruptions with scurf, whitish border and swelling. Okay, this is a vesicular rash. Interesting. Scrofulous and mercurial ulcers, also cancers. Red spots with small vesicles becoming confluent, showing darker and redder spots. Getting white from pressure with finger. Eruptions like roseola and scarlet fever. Okay, roseola looks like this. Scarlet fever. Let's look at the eruptions caused by scarlet fever. Oh, scarlet fever looks like this. A rash here. Okay. What do you suppose that scarlet fever and roseola are? Deadly nightshade poisoning. I wouldn't put it past these people. Erythema of skin. Right, here's erythema of skin. There's a rat. Those are kind of pustules and sores. Am I right? She was one of the first ones infected. Bleeding in the nose, ears, gums, the eyes hemorrhage. Yet inwardly it was scorched with such excessive heat that it could not bear the lightest covering or the finest linen upon it, but it must be left quite naked. Call your doctor at once if you have fever. Fever's gotten worse. Sounds like it might be fever. Let's take a look. Okay, fever, symptoms of belladonna. She's occasionally chilly, shivering running down back. Feels very chilly, wants warmth from a stove. I got the chills, it's that stuff, Bert. It's that goddamn stuff we breathe. What stuff? What, what are you talking about, Frank? Chill and heat alternating. Oh, that's interesting. Chill in evening, mostly on arms with heat of head. Internal chill with external burning heat. Heat of head with redness in face and delirium. During hot stage, delirium, redness, and puffiness of face, great thirst, heat, violent burning, internal or external, head hot, face red, eyes protruding, staring, skin hot, flying heat, whatever that means, great heat, typhoid fever. Why does it mention typhoid fever here? I thought typhoid fever was a different disease. But here they're like, oh, one of the symptoms of uh, belladonna poisoning is typhoid fever. Because that's what typhoid fever is. Belladonna poisoning. 
burning heat within and without, body burning like hot fire. But in Thucydides' description, they're tearing their clothes off and jumping into wells. They long for nothing so much as to be plunging into cold water. And many of those who were not properly attended threw themselves into wells. Is that something that a fever would do? I don't know about that. But let's take a look. Do we have anything like that here? Yes, we do. Okay, we start to see hallucinations. Uh, mental confusion. Merry craziness. Timorous insanity. Fantastic illusions when closing eyes. Weary of life with desire to drown herself. Inclination to bite those around him and to tear everything about him in pieces. Fury, they pulled at the hair of bystanders. Rage, madness, disposition to bite, to spit, to strike, and to tear things. Excited and delirious, with violent motions of arms and legs, increasing to a raging delirium. Bites at his attendants and himself, screams furiously. Jesus H. Christ! I'm sick! Back to the world! Such fury, with burning heat of body and open, staring, and immovable eyes that she had to be held constantly, lest she should attack someone. And when thus held so that she could not move, she spat continuously at those around her. She rather desires death than fears it. <laughs> Inclination to bite those around him and to tear everything about him in pieces. She wishes to strike, bite, and quarrel. Instead of eating, bit wooden spoon in two, gnawed plate, and growled and barked like a dog. <laughs> she attempted to bite and strike her attendants, broke into fits of laughter and gnashed her teeth. Head hot, face red, looks wild and fierce. Can you believe this? She tears at her night dress and bedclothes, became wantonly merry, ran from house and exposed their nakedness. There you go, tearing the clothes off. They behaved like drunken people. First, they would tear off my clothes. <laughs> Let's get some light over here. Ash is taking off her clothes again. Let's get those loafers. Insanity. They stripped themselves and clad only in their shirts ran into the streets in broad daylight, gesticulating, dancing, laughing, and uttering and doing many absurd things. There you go. <laughs> Nearly all symptoms lead to a violence of action. Patient must do everything violently. <laughs> She wishes those around her to kill her. You know I'm right. Like I told you, we could walk right by them. And many of those who were not properly attended threw themselves into wells, hurried by a thirst not to be extinguished. And whether they drank much or little, their torment still continued the same. Common side effects may include dry mouth. Okay, these Athenians seem quite thirsty. Anxious sinking for drink, great thirst, violent thirst at noon, excessive thirst for cold water. 
water. Yes, of course. Get Dr. Isaac some water. Water. You have to your turn, Help sir. Me. Help me. I need water. Ah! I have strict water. <laughs> Great thirst in evening with watery taste. All drinks are loathsome. Absence of thirst. Aversion to every kind of liquid. Violent, burning, suffocative, unquenchable thirst. With inability to swallow the least drop. Or with great aversion to drinks. The restlessness of their bodies and an utter inability of composing themselves by sleep never abated for a moment. Let's see, sleep. Now here they say great drowsiness and somnolency, so you're tired. The child is very drowsy, half sleeping, half waking. But sleep is prevented by anxiety. He can only sleep sitting up. Great inclination to sleep. Sleepy yet cannot sleep. Soporous means sleepy after the spasms. Restless tossing about, even twitching. During sleep, singing and loud talking, moaning, tossing about, screaming, starts. Children sleep with half-open eyes. Restlessness at night, grinding of teeth, now and then convulsions. Call your doctor at once if you have a seizure. We're keeping the patients isolated in here. Another thing is uh, spasms from laughing or crying. Great restlessness, bodies thrown to one side then to the other. Great restlessness with sudden startings, great irritability and sleeplessness. Twitching of extremities. Twitchings more in arm and face. Look, I think it'd be a lot wiser if we say contained Frank and Freddy, you know what I'm saying? No, what do you mean contained? Well, what I mean is lock them in a room somewhere so if they started acting funny they wouldn't hurt anybody. They don't want to hurt anybody. <laughs> you bastard, why don't you lock yourselves up? Look, lady, we're not proposing doing anything to them for Christ's sake. We just want to lock them in another room so we can figure out how to get the hell out of here, all right? Tina, that really is a good idea. <laughs> Convulsions commence in arm. Convulsive momentary extension of limbs on awaking. Repeated convulsions and horrible spasms, especially of flexor muscles. Common side effects may include muscle spasms. <laughs> and the body, so long as the distemper continued in its height, had no visible waste. Call your doctor at once if you have painful or difficult urination or severe constipation. Common side effects may include decreased sweating, but withstood its rage to a miracle, so that most of them perished within nine or seven days by the heat that scorched their vitals, though their strength was not exhausted, or if they continued longer, the distemper fell into the belly, causing violent ulcerations in the bowels. Violent ulceration in the bowels. Let's see what's happening in the bowels here with Belladonna. Scrobiculum and stomach. Scrobiculum is the, the pit of the stomach. And we'll go into the hypochondria. Hypochondria means under the cartilage. This is like under the, the uh, organs under the stomach. And the abdomen and loins. Painless throbbing and beating at pit of stomach. Painless. So here we go. Tensive pressing pain in pit of stomach. Painful pressure in pit of stomach, only when walking. Violent shooting, cutting pain. Could that be the violent ulcerations in the pit of the stomach? Okay, in the hypochondria region. Pain in liver. Region of liver, painful and sore to the touch. Abdomen and loins. Sudden, violent stinging, cutting, or pinching pain proceeding from one place in abdomen and spreading over a larger portion of it. Violent cutting pressure in hypogastrium. Now here, now there. Hypogastrium is literally means under the stomach. So it's the area under the stomach. 
Pains in abdomen cause violent screaming. Pain in abdomen as if raw and sore. Long-lasting painfulness of whole abdomen as if it were all sore and raw. The internal organs shut down. They liquefy. That's very good, Major. It hurts more than you can imagine. <laughs> Ulcerations in the bowels. This is another thing that doesn't make sense. This is supposed to be some kind of bacteria, right? So the bacteria is working its way, and then in nine or seven days, cuts holes in your bowels. Like, why would bacteria do that? Like, food rots. Does bacteria kill living organisms this, this quickly? What would cause ulcerations in the bowels? To my mind, it's not bacteria eating into the bowels. It's poison that's in the bowels dissolving the lining of the stomach. That's what it sounds like to me. Accompanied with an incessant flux. What is flux? Merriam-Webster dictionary, pretty reputable dictionary. Definition of flux. A flowing of fluid from the body, such as diarrhea or dysentery. Call your doctor at once if you have severe diarrhea. Diarrhea. Well, here we have contradictory symptoms in the plague of Athens where he says they had incessant flux, which is diarrhea, and yet also no visible waste. So how do you square this circle that they have both? Call your doctor at once if you have severe diarrhea or severe constipation. Well, same thing happens in the belladonna poisoning. That's really weird. Check this out. Stools and rectum and urinary organs. Frequent urging to stool without result, or with a very scanty or hard evacuation. Frequent urging to stool, sometimes ineffectual and with tenismus. Tenismus is where you you feel like you need to go to the bathroom, but you just went to the bathroom. Straining to stool. The evacuation is undoubtedly diuretic, diarrhea, but very little is voided and immediately after follows much straining. Slimy and bloody diuretic stools. Escape of feces when passing wind. It's like sharding. Belladonna causes sharding. Sense of constipation. Obstinate constipation. And yet diarrhea with pressure on bladder. The diuretic stool is followed by frequent urging. No more stool being passed. And what about the urinary organs? Very frequent desire to urinate, even if only a few drops had accumulated. Frequent desire to urinate, but urine voided in remarkably small quantities, although of a natural color. Diminished urine. Frequent copious emission of urine. It's the opposite of diminished urine, isn't it? Urine, either suppressed or profuse, accompanied with an incessant flux, by which many reduced to an excessive weakness were carried off. And I'm weak too. Me too. For the malady beginning in the head and settling first there, sunk afterwards gradually down the whole body because it was ingested in the mouth and went down the digestive tract to the, the bowels. That's what it looks like logically to me. Am I the first person in thousands of years to figure this out? <laughs> Has this occurred only to me in thousands of years? I can't possibly be the only one, am I? And whoever got safe through all its most dangerous stages, uh, yet the extremities of their bodies still retain the marks of its violence. For it shot down into their privy members, into their fingers and toes, by losing which they escaped with life. Extremities are falling off. Their penis, toes, and fingers are falling off. Uh, let's see what's happening in belladonna poisoning. Male sexual organs and female sexual organs. Inflammation of testicles. Violent stitches in testicles. Tearing upward in left spermatic cord. Violent pressing and urging towards genitals as if everything would fall out of there. Okay, so it doesn't say anything about it falling off or losing it in some way, right? What about the extremities falling off? What about the upper limbs, lower limbs, limbs in general? Let's check this out. Paralytic pressure in left upper arm with paralytic feeling and weakness of whole left arm. 
Violent stabbing as with a blunt knife, blow ahead of humorous from within out. Tearing pain and humorous. Humorous is the uh, the upper arm bone. Numbness and prickling in hands. Hands swollen, dry, drops things. Lower extremities cold and semi-rigid. Cold feet. Boring digging or shooting pains in soles. Paralysis of lower extremities together with neck of bladder and sphincter ani. But nothing, nothing here makes me think like that these limbs are dying or going to be falling off like in the Plague of Athens. Like here, twitch, your limbs in general. Convulsive movements of limbs. Heaviness of hands and feet. Stinging or tingling in limbs. I suppose that could lead to uh, dead limbs, right? Gangrene. Hands and feet become very cold. Lassitude of limbs. Well, let's take a look at gangrene. Okay, tissues. Would it lead to gangrene? Yes. Atrophy and wasting of scrofulous subjects. And what does scrofulous mean? Scrofulous means having a diseased, run-down appearance. Atrophy and wasting away. Well, that could lead to the dying of limbs, right? And the possible falling off of those limbs. Could be. And this is about the skin. Intense erysipitalous fever. Accompanied by inflamed swellings, passing even into gangrene. Gangrene is the dying of flesh, so maybe this is indeed where we, we see extremities falling off or being cut off. Now my arms and legs are cramping. <laughs> That's one thing you'll find in belladonna poisoning is cramping. Let's do a search for cramps. And you'll find it, there's cramps basically everywhere. So here we have cramps in the outer head. Cramps in the parotid, which is the salivary glands, and in the ears, there's cramping. In the nose, upper face, cramps of hands and feet, uh, stomach cramps, uh, lower intestine cramps, urinary organs, there's cramps. In the... Uh, Female sexual organs, there's cramps, cramp of stomach, cramp of stomach, uterus cramp, cramps in legs, in the lumbar region, in the back, there's a cramp, uh, lower limbs, there's cramps, knee joints, cramp in right knee, cramp in the one side of the chest, yeah, there you go, so, lots of cramps. Some there were who lost their eyes. Some lost their eyes. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean they lost the function of their eyes? Or their eyes just fell out or died? I don't know. Let's see. Sight and eyes. Well, in Belladonna Poisoning, they don't mention eyes dying or falling out. However, they do mention blindness. So we say sparse or dimness of vision. Dimness of vision or actual blindness. Headache makes him first blind, then unconscious. Partial blindness, cannot read anything printed. Blindness following severe congestive headaches with scarlet fever. Photopsia and then sudden blindness. What are you waiting for? I can't focus. I can't see. This is a good paper right here. Uh, Tropa Belladonna Deadly Nightshade. The deadly nightshade, Atropa belladonna, is a plant surrounded by myth, fear, and awe. In antiquity, the Greeks and the Romans knew that it contained a deadly poison. So it is a poison the Greeks knew about. In this, the final article of a short series on the Solon essay. What's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained. And today, we'll be taking a look at the Solanum virus featured in the 2013 zombie disaster film, World War Z. Solanaceae, which is the family of plants to which Belladonna belongs to. The Solanum virus wastes no time once it's infected a host. The virus successfully uses the cells of the brain's frontal lobe for replication, which subsequently destroys them in the process. 
Solanum virus in World War Z. Solanine is a poison found in the species of nightshade family within the genus Solanum. Solanum is the Solanaceae family, right? And also contains the nightshades and horse nettles. It really is that obvious. A plant hallowed by long tradition as one of the classic poisons of antiquity. Look at Stan. Hold it there, Stanley! Hold it, don't! Hi, Stan! Who's that? Who's that? Extracted from the plant is the alkaloid atropine. Tell them to take the atropine now. The atropine, it's your wood. What? Where's my water, water? One minute! Order the atropine now! Inject it in your heart before your suit melts. Shit. They can take it too. Where's that water? Get that away from me. Is this movie The Rock for real? That atropine, one of the poisons in Deadly Nightshade, is also an antidote to another poison, like nerve gas. Two poisons can cancel each other out inside your body. That's what apparently this, this uh, website says. Atropine availability as an antidote for nerve agent casualties. Take the atropine now, Stan, for Christ's sake! We're fucked. So to me, this sounds like another episode of The Secret Covenant. We will promise to find a cure from our many fronts, yet we will feed them more poison. Is that shoot melt? If you die, we all will die! Inject your heart and then defuse the bomb! Well, just do it, Stan! What if I miss my heart? I can't see shit! Do it now! Look how big this is! You want me to stick this into my heart? Are you fucking nuts? Ah, uh, but wait. On the contrary, it does actually act like this. Now, atropine is an anticholinergic drug, and it does all these things. Okay, so you're, you're gonna see a lowering of secretions, uh, bronchodilatation, and all these things. Uh, and they counteract cholinergic drugs, which is like nerve gas, I guess, is a cholinergic drug. And then atropine is an anticholinergic drug. So it, this does have this effect where they're both poisons, but these poisons do cancel each other out if they're both in your body. So it's uh, interesting. <laughs> Blind as a bat. One of the classical features of atropine is dilation of the pupils due to the effect on the sphincter muscle of the iris. successfully bond with the T-Virus to fully realize her powers. Well, now I have need of you, the old you. So I've given you back your gift. You are the weapon. Then watch Gotham tear itself apart through fear. We will make them rip each other's hearts apart and kill their own children. We will accomplish this by using hate as our ally, anger as our friend. I'm gonna kill you. The virus drastically alters behavior, but also begins to cause physical changes to the host, such as albinism, total hair loss, and dilated pupils. Accommodation is also affected and the vision becomes blurred. A severe intolerance to UV light begins to develop, similar to vampirism. In severe cases, the iris becomes invisible and the effect can last for several days, indeed for as long as a fortnight. Fortnight is two weeks. When the other signs of poisoning have long abated. Compound 6 appears to be showing decreased aggression response. Partial pigmentation return. Slight pupil constriction. How it works. Atropine, the nerve gas antidote. In the hours following the reported chemical weapons attack in the suburbs of Damascus last Wednesday, 
Ailing men, women, and children flocked to the city's hospitals. Doctors in the Syrian capital treated thousands of patients who were experiencing neurotoxic symptoms, including pinpoint pupils. Well, that's the opposite of what atropine does, right? Dilates the pupils. Nerve gas shrinks it down to pinpoints. Some there were who lost their eyes. And some who, being quite recovered, had at once totally lost all memory. And quite forgot not only their most intimate friends, but even their own selves. Memory loss. Does Belladonna do this? Let's take a look. The mind. Loss of consciousness. Stupefaction. With congestion to the head. Delirium. Memory lively. Remembers things long gone by. Well, yeah, but here, memory impaired. Forgets in a moment what he was about to do. Absent-minded and forgetful. Now how many fingers am I holding up? Three. Good. Now tell me your name. I... I don't know. He's fine. Memory loss. Just like the other one. Mental confusion. Confusion of head. Timorous insanity. He's afraid of an imaginary black dog, of the gallows, etc. Call your doctor at once if you have hallucinations. In former days, a common misdiagnosis was that of scarlet fever, which could very well be the same thing, deadly nightshade poisoning. But at the present time, it would be more likely to be measles or roseola in phantom. See, all these diseases could be just the same thing, deadly nightshade poisoning. Mad as a hen. The central anticholinergic effects of atropine can result in a bizarre mental state resembling mania. Speech may become incoherent and unintelligible. This together with an accompanying ataxic gait. This video demonstrates the ataxic gait pattern. This gait pattern is characterized by quite significant incoronation of the lower limbs, swaying in the body, and high risk for falls. Looking at the lower limbs, foot placement is variable, and step lengths change constantly with the foot crossing the midline. We could just walk right past him. We wouldn't even have to run. We could just walk right past him. We're going to continue now with the cerebellotaxia gait. This is more with less control and the coordination is really out of whack. And you can notice they don't really get a lot of, it's not so, it's not really fluid. Going at the, uh, going around. He came crazy. Got one leg over the window to kill himself. Had to be tied down. Died next day. Imbecility. Fantastic illusions when closing eyes. When closing eyes, though not asleep, patient sees fierce, wicked-looking large animals with horns and bushy heads. Room seemed to be full of strange men passing in and out who would snatch at her as they passed, which frightened her very much. She thought the men wanted to take her away from home, 
She then saw children sitting on low benches in rows in a schoolroom. Hallucinations and illusions of senses. Imagines he sees ghosts, hideous faces, and various insects. Oh, having trouble. Take a seat, have a drink. You look like a man who takes himself too seriously. He's afraid of an extraordinary black dog, the gallows, etc. He sees ghosts and insects, gets vexed easily, and then weeps. He tears things around him, bites and strikes. You seem to be in some sort of... And when restrained, spits at those around him, strikes himself, curses and uses horrible words. Spit me, man! She took a chunk clean right out of me! Stay down. I'm warning you, stay down! She's crazy. Fixed ideas, thinks he is riding on an ox, uses a stick for a gun, growling and barking like a dog. There you are. There's nothing to fear me. Delirium, with frightful figures and images before eyes, is afraid of imaginary things, sees monsters. Taste of your own medicine, doctor. <laughs> Talks of dogs as if they swarmed about him, furious. <gasps> Delirium. The boy jumped out of bed, talked a great deal, was lively, and often laughed. Consciousness was entirely gone. He did not recognize his parents, and quite forgot not only their most intimate friends, but even their own selves. Why can't I remember anything? The hive has its own defense mechanisms. All computer control. A nerve gas was released into the house. Primary effect of the gas, complete unconsciousness, lasting anything up to four hours. Secondary effects are varied, but can include acute memory loss. In evening, he was seized with such violent delirium that it required three men to confine him. You said if we destroyed the brain, it'd die. It worked in the movie! Well, it ain't working now, Frank. You mean the movie lied? Do you mean the movie lied? How could a movie lie? Aren't they all lies? I mean, if it's not based on a true story. But this one claims to be a true story. This clip shows up again in the end credits. It worked in the movie! Well, it ain't working now, Frank. You mean the movie lied? It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question, Bert. It's not a bad question. Excited and delirious with violent motions of arms and legs, increasing to a raging delirium. See how easy that was? The movie lied by convincing you that this is not real, that this doesn't really happen. Bites at his attendants and himself, screams furiously. Fury, they pull at the hair of bystanders. For as this distemper was in general virulent beyond expression, and as every part more grievous than yet had fallen to the lot of human nature, so in one particular instance it appeared to be none of the natural infirmities of man. Since the birds and the beasts that prey on human flesh either never approach the dead bodies, of which many lay about uninterred, they were unburied, just lying around, or certainly perished if they ever tasted. What's wrong 
their eyes. You're feeding on infected flesh. So this is strange. Birds and beasts are not even eating the dead people that died of this disease. Or if they do, they die. So then you go, wait, is this, is this disease transmissible to birds and beasts? And if so, wouldn't it be contracted by the Peloponnesian army? No, it's never contracted by the Peloponnesian army. This, this disease only affects the Athenians. How is that possible? Well, it's possible if it's a poison. Poisoning. Uh, we have two men poisoned here. Uh, well, no, we, we don't know what kind of poison. And also, the birds and beasts are not eating it. How would animals know whether this person had a disease or not? You know, they can't. Can you smell a disease? Well, how, how would they know? Because you can smell a poison. Okay, you know, animals know not to eat certain berries, certain fruits, certain poisonous things, right? So how do the animals know not to eat this stuff? Because it's a poison, not a disease. Atropa belladonna intoxication, a case report. When the history of ingestion of berries is clear and the plant is rapidly identified, there are usually few problems with the diagnosis. However, where the poison has passed through an intermediate animal, then the diagnosis can be difficult and confusing, like in the case of meat from cattle and rabbits, which have grazed on a trope of belladonna. In other words, the meat from a poisoned animal can pass on to the animal that eats it. For example here, the ASPCA has a thing on deadly nightshade and its effect on your pets. Toxicity. Toxic to dogs, toxic to cats, toxic to horses. And if they eat somebody or something that has eaten belladonna, then they will also get sick. Hmm, that fits the plague of Athens just fine. One proof of this is the total disappearance then of such birds. I was forced to travel the last few kilometers on foot before arriving at Castle Dracula. The castle appeared innocuous enough in the warm afternoon sun, and all seemed normal, but for one thing, there were no birds singing. For not one was to be seen, neither in any other place, or about any one of the carcasses. But the dogs, because of their familiarity with man, afforded a more notorious proof of the event. <laughs> Why do, the, why do the animals know not to eat the people? Because it's a poison, okay? The animals have an instinct not to eat this poison. The nature of this pestilential disorder was in general, for I purposely omitted its many varied appearances, or the circumstances particular to some of the infected in contradiction to others, such as hath been described. Wait, wait, he's omitted varied appearances or things that contradicted others. And we've seen some of that with Belladonna in Materia Medica. Diminished urine. Frequent copious emission of urine. Memory lively. Remembers things long gone by. Well, yeah, but here, memory impaired. Or maybe because there were multiple poisons and different people died of different poisons. And they had different symptoms. And then you go, well, how are they being attacked by several diseases? at once because it's several poisons like one of them could be nightshade one of them could be hemlock you see what i'm saying it's like oh we just get rid of the these other varied appearances because that might give it away that they're using several different poisons same thing happened during the black death none of the common maladies incident to human nature prevailed at that time or whatever disorder anywhere appeared it ended in this He's, he's, he said it again. It's like, yeah, what, what phenomenon would cause this unless it's something similar to what's happening in COVID-19? The doctors in the city are in on it. Some died merely for want of care, and some with all the care that could possibly be taken. 
nor was any one medicine discovered from whence could be promised any certain relief, since that which gave ease to one was prejudicial to another. Okay, the rest of this is not essential to the disease. Okay, here. But those especially who had safely gone through it took pity on the dying and the sick, because they knew by experience what it really was, and were now secure in themselves, for it never seized anyone a second time so as to be mortal. Such, as, such were looked upon as quite happy by others, and were themselves at first overjoyed in their late escape, and groundless hope that hereafter no distemper would prove fatal to them. So here, I, I guess, they become immune to the disease. This would contradict it being a poison, right? Unless Thucydides is making it up here, which I think is entirely possible. We can see today people getting COVID multiple times. But here they say, no, you could only get the plague of Athens once, and then the next time, maybe you got the symptoms, but you didn't die. Oh, here's another instance of their thirst. Some were tumbling one over another in the public streets, or lay expiring round about every fountain, whither they had crept to assuage their immoderate thirst. Okay, page 159. Okay, here's, here's the tail end of the description. The pestilence broke out immediately upon the eruption of the Peloponnesians, and never extended itself to Peloponnesus. So the, the plague never reached the Peloponnesian League only the Athenians, and a few other cities. A circumstance which ought to be related. Thank you for relating it. The, so, the, so the disease started a few days after the Peloponnesian League arrived, uh, and it never touched the Peloponnesians. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. It raged the most, and for the longest time in Athens, but afterwards spread into the other towns, especially the most populous, and this is an exact account of the plague. But never touched the Peloponnesian League. Spartans, what did you do? And now for the coup de grace, the final conquest of Athens by Sparta, which, turns out, was not written by Thucydides, whose book ends seven years before the war does. So, to read what happens, we turn to Hellenica by Xenophon. Let me know if anything seems off to you. Now when Theremenes and the other ambassadors were at Selassia, and on being asked with what proposals they had come, replied that they had full power to treat for peace. So they're ambassadors from Athens to the Lacedaemonians. The ephors, they're the rulers of Sparta, thereupon gave orders to summon them to Lacedaemon. When they arrived, the ephors called an assembly at which the Corinthians, and Thebans in particular, though many other Greeks agreed with them, opposed making a treaty with the Athenians and favored destroying their city. Anything seem off to you so far? The ambassadors are just waltzing into the enemy camp. Anyone contracting the disease? Nope. <laughs> Nobody's even worried about it. The Lacedaemonians, however, said that they would not enslave a Greek city which had done great service amid the greatest perils that had befallen Greece, and they offered to make peace on these conditions. Oh, that's very nice of them. Watch this. That the Athenians should destroy the long walls and the walls of Piraeus, surrender all their ships except twelve, allow their exiles to return, count the same people friends and enemies as the Lacedaemonians did, and follow the Lacedaemonians both by land and by sea, wherever they should lead the way. So they became kind of like uh, helots to the Spartans. He has memory and reasoning skills. This is incredible. The serum works. You've domesticated them. You've done it. So Theramenes and his fellow ambassadors brought back this word to Athens. And as they were entering the city, a great crowd gathered around them, fearful that they had returned unsuccessful, for it was no longer possible to delay on account of the number who were dying of the famine. So the Spartans and the Athenians, they had contact with one another, didn't uh, transmit the disease. It's amazing. These people, they're like, uh, they're like Alice in Resident Evil. They're immune. The next day, the ambassadors reported to the assembly the terms on which the Lacedaemonians offered to make peace. 
The Remini's acted as a spokesman for the embassy and urged that it was best to obey the Lacedaemonians and tear down the walls. And while some spoke in opposition to him, a far greater number supported him and it was voted to accept the peace. After this, Lysander sailed into Piraeus, the exiles returned, and the Peloponnesians, with great enthusiasm, began to tear down the walls to the music of flute girls, thinking that that day was the beginning of freedom for Greece. And nobody caught the plague again. Not one Peloponnesian got the plague. <laughs> you know why? I know why. Now, at the beginning of this uh, video series, I said uh, I'm 80% sure, right? Well, I'm going to bump that up to maybe, I don't know, 88%. I'm about 88% sure now that this is what really happened. Correct me if I'm wrong. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Up next is Typhus, aka War Fever. Killed more people in every European war than war itself did. And it doesn't even exist. Deadly nightshade. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Deep beneath the streets of Raccoon City, a top secret research facility owned and operated by the Umbrella Corporation. The hive houses over 500 technicians.